Chapters 18 and 19 of John's account of the life of Christ, which really only covers about 20 days of his life in actual physical counting, is a sad chapter, a sad period in the life of our Lord. We're going to study today the arrest and crucifixion of the Master. My name is Keith Mosier, Sr. I'm one of the instructors at the Memphis School of Preaching, and it is, has been my privilege to study this gospel account with you in a series of lessons on the Gospel Broadcasting Network. And we welcome you to this study, again, of John chapters 18 and 19. Now, John skips for us the fact that in the garden, something physical began to occur in the Lord's body. Luke tells us about this. Now, we have in John 17, the high priestly prayer of the Master. A wonderful prayer for himself, his apostles, and for all of us, that we all be one as he is in the Father and the Father is in him, that they all may be one that the world might believe that he, the Christ, was sent by the Father. John 17, 20 and 21. Now Luke tells us that while he was in the garden, this happened. He was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, that is, from Peter, James, and John, and kneeled down and prayed and said, Father, if it be possible, remove this cup from me, nevertheless not my will, but thine be done. And then we're told this, and there appeared an angel from heaven strengthening him. Why? Watch what Luke tells us. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Those who do archaeological and uh, discoveries concerning medical issues of this period in history have offered the suggestion that this may have been hematidrosis, when great trauma causes the blood vessels right under the skin to break, and the blood starts coming out, what would be the pores of the sweat? If that's the case, the Lord's physical agony began in the garden, not on the cross. And he would always... Uh, he would already have been in a state of shock at this point. I asked my medical doctor's son about this, and I said, what is usually the, the result of hematidrosis? He said, well, Dad, you can die from it. Uh, the trauma is so great that you bleed that way. The shock to your body is so great that it can kill you. Uh, if that's what this is, hematidrosis, then it's the fact that the Lord's agony has already put him into a state of shock, but prior to uh, his going to the cross, he's arrested. Now, let's read that in John 18. When Jesus has spoken these words, that's the high priestly prayer, John 17, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where was a garden under which, the which he entered and his disciples. Now, he's left the spot where he was praying, and he goes over a little brook and comes into another part of the garden. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, been there before with the one he, he called his master one time. For Jesus oft time resorted thither with his disciples. Now watch what happened. Jesus then, having received a band and officers from the chief priests, officers, temple police, along with a band of soldiers. If this is a complete band, a Roman cohort, that's 600 men. This could have been, it's a maniple, just 200 men. That's a, quite a number to arrest one man, don't you think? Now, what they do here is illegal, according to Jewish law. They are arresting Jesus, a Jew, at night on a holy day. It's Passover week. It's illegal. And everything they do from this moment of his arrest is illegal. Nothing here is done according to Roman law or Jewish law. I would recommend a book to you who are watching this by William Chandler called The Trials of Jesus. Mr. Chandler was a lawyer 
And he, did, he studied the Jewish law, he studied Roman law, and he went through these arrests to show that everything they did, Jew and Roman, was illegal. This is a kangaroo court. They want him dead. They want him crucified. Now, I want to reiterate, the Jews could have stoned him. They stoned Stephen later, but they wanted him tortured. And the Romans knew how to torture a man when it came to crucifixion. Judas then, having received a band and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Think about that. These people were afraid of Jesus. Well, they'd seen his miracles. I don't know what they were thinking. These are also a superstitious people. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? <laughs> Who are you looking to find? They were looking to find him, weren't they? He knew that. He knows exactly what's going to take place. He's been predicting it. So here are these superstitious people who think there's safety in numbers, and they come to arrest him the second person of the Godhead in human flesh. And I guess they thought they had power over him, <laughs> although they seemed awfully afraid of him. Then answered him, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am. You found me. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. Think about that a while. His disciple is standing with the world. He had fallen from grace. He'd been able to do miracles, Matthew 10, 1 through 6. Now he's standing with the world. It happens. Don't know why Judas did this. We know he was covetous. He wanted money. Maybe he saw a chance to make more money. I don't know why, what his motive was. I do know that he had worldly sorrow after he did this, went out and whipped bitterly and hanged himself. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am, <laughs> they went backward and fell to the ground. Ego and me, I am. And when he said it, they fell down. There's always power in his voice, but that's amazing, is it not? You know, this voice spoke the world into existence. <laughs> and this crowd of 200, 600 fell on the ground. Then they asked him again. Then he asked them again. <laughs> Looking at them falling on the ground, they said, uh, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I told you, I am he. Now watch the Lord's compassion here. If you then seek me, let these go away. Let my friends leave. Don't arrest them. One man says two words, and a whole Roman band falls on the ground. And that one who's powerful enough to do that, and this isn't considered a great miracle, although I happen to think it probably was a miracle. But anyways, that's my opinion. But anyways, this one who has the power to speak and they fall down said with compassion, think about it, the power and the compassion of God seen right here said, let these go away. Don't arrest them. And so he wants release of the 11, that the saying might be fulfilled which you speak of them which thou gavest me, have I lost none. And then Simon Peter, <laughs> here goes quick acting Peter. He has some courage. He's the one that said at the Last Supper, I'll die with you. He draws his sword and smote the high priest servant and cut off his right ear. Well, Peter is right-handed. Well, if you swing at a man and he goes like that, 
or like that. You cut off his right ear. You weren't aiming for his ear. Peter was trying to split his head open. The servant's name was Malchus. That's the high priest's servant. One of the high priest's highest servants is here. Luke twenty two fifty one tells us this is the high priest's servant. And God, and God said, Jesus said, Peter, put up your sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Peter, you're interfering with God's purpose here. Put up your sword. You don't want to use your sword to interfere with God's purpose. Then the band and the captain and the officers and Jesus took him and bound him. Now Luke tells us that Jesus healed Malchus' ear, put it right back on. Now they saw that. Those soldiers saw that ear come off. They saw Jesus put it back. They still arrested him. They had fallen on the ground when he spoke. They still arrested him. And they bound him. They really are afraid of him, are they not? Verse 12. The band and the captain and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. He's detained illegally by a group of people who so, are so intent on arresting him, they ignore what they just saw with their own eyes. Their hatred, their worldly attitude, Judas stood right there and watched this. Another miracle. Maybe two. They all fell down. Judas was with them. I suppose he fell down too. Now Caiaphas was he. And Annas. Now I've already talked to us about Annas and Caiaphas. Annas had been taken out of office as the high priest by the Roman government because of his greed and avarice. He had extorted money, and done other things illegally at the temple. But the Jews still considered him the high priest. His son-in-law, Anna's son-in-law, Caiaphas, was the one who was legally the high priest. But the Jews did not look to him as the high priest. So they ignored the Roman uh, edict that had taken Annas out of office and took Jesus to Annas. That's illegal. They took him to the very one they considered the high priest of their Supreme Court. To put it in modern terms. That would be like taking me to the Supreme Court before I went through the lower courts. It's illegal. If the high priest decides, then what's the lower court going to say? You have no choice. But if you get all of them together voting, you might get a different verdict going on up to the high priest. This is illegal. But they take him first to Annas. And when you think about the Jewish trial, think about Annas, Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin, the entire council. It's interesting to me that they took him first to Annas. Now Caiaphas was the son-in-law, high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. What they're doing here is illegal, folks. Annas was a collaborator with the Romans. He was hated by the Jews, but he's the power behind, behind the throne. And from A.D. 6... To AD 15, he was legally the high priest. He is no longer. He caused political increase. He was greedy, as I've already said. He charged exorbitant prices to exchange Roman denarii for Jewish shekels at the temple. He, uh, in today's terms, these guys became millionaires from the temple funds. But when the people brought this man to the high priest, they brought him to Annas sort of bypassing Roman law, but it's illegal. And Annas, as we've already taught you in another session, kept his sons or sons-in-law appointed high priest year after year. 
the Jews, when they talked about what was going on at the temple, called it the Bazaar of Annas. They knew what he did, but they still bring Jesus to him. This is a corrupt individual who sits in judgment of God. And let me say this to every governmental leader who will ever see this tape, whoever you are in whatever part of the world you are, United States, Russia, or wherever you are, you're not in charge. God is. God put you there for a reason. First Romans 13, 1 through 6. The powers that be are ordered of God. You didn't get there by yourself. But here is a leader, a governmental leader, sitting in judgment of Christ, and the governmental leader is corrupt. And this has happened throughout history, where men have sat, in a, and corrupt men have sat, base men have sat, and made judgment about God. Not a new thing, but it has happened in history over and over again. So he comes to Annas, then to Caiaphas, and then he will come to the Sanhedrin. Let's read. Somebody is following Peter. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest. My opinion is that's John the Apostle who wrote this. And went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. But Peter stood outside. Then went out that other disciple was known unto the priest, spake not unto her that kept the door and brought in Peter. I said, Peter, come on in. They know me here. Then saith the disciple that kept the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art thou not thou also one of this man's disciples? You remember what the Lord told him? Of course. Before the morning comes, Peter, you'll deny me three times. Oh no, Lord, I'll die with you. There's a message there for us. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall, the Proverbs writer told us. When I start thinking that I can, I can do it, maybe I better stop and think that God can do it. Maybe I can't. Maybe I should let him strengthen me. Peter's pride got in the way here. And when he came down to it and his faith is really tested, he said, I am not. Why didn't he say, I am? Well, what's the fear here? Fear of death. The fear of man is a snare, the Proverbs writer wrote. Perfect love will cast out that kind of fear, but fear is a strange thing. It's false evidence that appears real, F-E-A-R. What I'm fearing probably isn't exactly true, but I fear it anyway. The ancient Jews would not go into Canaan because of their fear of the people. And that fear was so contagious, it spread throughout the entire congregation. Numbers 14, 1. And in one night, they're all crying, oh, we can't do it. Those people are too big and they're too mighty. And two men stood up and said, we can do it. We can do it because God is with us. The fear overrode the courage of the two. And that fear kept those people out of Canaan for 40 years. What is our fear doing to us? Peter's afraid. He's afraid he'll be put to death. And the servants and all stood there who had made a fire of coals where it was cold, and they warned themselves, and Peter stood with them, warned himself. And then the story's interrupted here. The account of Peter's interrupted. And we go back to the high priest. The high priest said, where are your followers? He mocks him. You're all by yourself. What happened to your followers? Nobody wanted to come in here with you? This is Annas. And of his doctrine, Jesus said, I spoke openly to the people. You know what I've been teaching. Why did you ask me that? You know what I've been teaching. I've kept it 
out there in the world. Everybody knows what I teach. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple. Same thing. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That was his message. The Jews know what I teach. They're always there at the temple or the synagogue. I said nothing in secret. So you know exactly what I teach. In fact, he's challenging Annas. Why are you asking me that? You know what I teach. Annas hates him. He's envious of him. He doesn't like the crowds following Jesus. And so he said, where are your disciples now? Uh, what do you think of Annas? He reminds me of a snotty little kid. He's awfully hateful. Why askest thou me, Jesus said. You know what I teach, Annas. Ask them which heard me what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. What a challenge. And when he had thus spoken, one of the hours that stood by the struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, You answer the high priest that way? Can you imagine? Police brutality, huh? From a temple guard, a temple police, supposedly a man of God, just hit the Lord right in the face. He turned his face to the smiters, Isaiah said. And that was 700 and some years before it happened. They hit him again here. Now he's already suffered hematidrosis, folks. He'll be up all night. We know he's strong because he walked all over Palestine. He, was, he had been a carpenter's son, so he worked that way. So he, he has some strength physically, but he's being worn down. And now he's hit. And then Jesus said, if I have spoken evil, tell me what it was I spoke. Why did you hit me? <laughs> Why did you hit me? Good question from the second person of the Godhead, is it not? What gave you the right to hit me? What, everything they do here is illegal. He has no legal right to hit him. He shouldn't have been in Anna's place anyway. Now, Anna has sent him bound unto Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, that's illegal. Jesus isn't under anybody's jurisdiction here anyway. He's God in the flesh. He really is over them. But they're ordering him around now. So he sends him from Annas to Caiaphas, notice, verse 24. So now there's your second Jewish trial in front of Caiaphas. And Simon Peter, now we go back to Peter. He's already said one time, I am not. He said that to the young girl at the door. Now he's standing by this fire, warming himself. And they said, Art thou therefore unto him, Art thou not one of his disciples? I am not. One of the servants of this fire, High priest being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off. This guy had been in the garden. He says, did not I see thee in the garden with him? No, Peter must have said. Peter denied again. That's three times. I am not. I am not. No. And immediately, morning sounded. The cock crew. We know what Peter did. Like Judas, he went out, Peter did, and wept bitterly. But he will repent. And Jesus will look right at him. And Peter will see Jesus looking at him, knowing what he just did. He has to remember what he was told at the Last Supper. He's caught. Judas was caught. He hanged himself. Peter's caught. He's going to repent. What's the difference? Godly sorrow in Peter's case, worldly sorrow in Judah's case. If you get caught, what kind of sorrow are you going to have? For godly sorrow causes repentance, never to be regretted. 
but the sorrow of the world causes death. Paul wrote 2 Corinthians 7.10. So you have a great example now of the difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. You have one who, who knew he did something wrong, but he wasn't willing to ask God to forgive him. He just hanged himself. Here's one who did something very wrong, but he's willing to repent. He got caught. Jesus looked him right in the eye. But being caught, he decided to repent. Now, they led Jesus from Caiaphas under the hall of judgment. Now it's early in the morning. He's been up all night. Suffered blood coming out of the pores of his skin in the garden. Tremendous trauma of knowing he's about to bear the sin of the world. Tremendous trauma of crucifixion coming. He knows it. He knows exactly what he's going to have to go through. And now he's been up all night and they take him to the Sanhedrin. There have been many guesses as to why the Jews did this. I think that they did it trying to make themselves look good. Well, if the whole Sanhedrin says it, it will be all right. I think Annas and Caiaphas did that trying to make themselves look good with the people. Well, we took him to the whole council. But after, they'd already made judgment of what they were going to do. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. The they, in verse 28, is the Sanhedrin itself. They take him, Jesus, to Pilate's judgment hall, but they won't step on the stones where that hall begins. Why? They would corrupt themselves and wouldn't be able to take the Passover. They would have touched the Gentile area, and they couldn't do that. One of their 613 traditions has to do with keeping kosher. The image of Caesar was on everything then, and the Jews looked at those as idols or icons. They can't touch that. They'll lose their right to take the Passover. Don't want to do that. You can't miss the Passover. And we've got to crucify the Son of God here. They went not into the judgment and all lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. I can't read that without getting disgusted at their attitude. I'm sorry. I just, I get disgusted. But they wouldn't touch those areas of the Gentiles, they might be defiled. The irony should not escape us of that situation. He's illegally arrested, taken to the very judgment hall of the Romans, but they won't come near it. They might not eat the Passover. So Pilate goes out to them. He's a, he's a great political figure here. There's a crowd out there, so out comes this political figure. He said, what accusation bring you against this man? Why did you bring him to me? They answered and said unto him, watch this, if he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him unto thee. How would you like to be arrested? And when you asked the policeman, why are you arresting me? They said, well, if you hadn't done anything wrong, we wouldn't arrest you. Wait a minute, what's the charge? Well, if you hadn't done anything wrong, we wouldn't be arresting you. There's no charge. This is illegal. They don't have a, they don't have a reason to arrest him. But they say to Pilate, well, if he hadn't done anything wrong, we wouldn't have brought him here. What mockery. And Pilate said to them, well, take him then and judge him according to your law. And then watch Pilate now try everything he can to wash his hands of this whole affair. He doesn't want to have anything to do with it. He's afraid the report will get back to Rome that he's not able to control the Jewish population. He'll lose his position. Take him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said to him, it is not law for us to put any man to death. That's not true. But not to put him to death the way you folks do it. Then the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spoke and signifying what death he should die. He told his disciples, this is what they're going to do to me. They're going to crucify me, not stone me. Well, this is the prophecy. Psalm 22, Isaiah 53. He'll be crucified. Crucifixion didn't 
occur when the Psalms were written. It didn't occur when Isaiah wrote. This is a futuristic prophecy of an event that those folks had never seen practiced, showing us that God wrote this book or had this book written, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus knows this is a trap question. So he says to Pilate, Do you think this up yourself, or does somebody else tell you to say it? What a put down of Pilate. You're not smart enough to think this up yourself, Pilate. Who told you to ask me that? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? <laughs> Thine own nation and the chief of the unto me, What did you do? Didn't they tell you they arrested you? <laughs> no. They told him they, they, if he hadn't done anything wrong, they wouldn't have brought him. And so he said, Pilate said, What did you do? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered up to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from thence? I didn't do anything. Not in this world. My kingdom isn't even of this world. So am I a king? Yes, but not of this world. Art thou a king then? Jesus said, You said it. Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. That's exactly right. I am a king. Now, Pilate's got a, a reason to be a little bit afraid. This guy says he's a king. I'm the one that's in charge here. And this is the reason I came into the world, that I should keep witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Now watch what he says. What is truth? I could tell Pilate what truth is. John's already told us that Jesus said, Thy word is truth. And Jesus said, I am the truth. So his being and his word are the truth. John 17, 17, John 14, 6. That's what the truth is. What is truth? He's looking right at it, Pilate is, when he looks, when he says that. And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said unto them, I don't find any fault in him. He says he's not a king of this world. What's your problem? But ye have a custom. Watch this political machination here. You have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will you therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but, the, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a thief. I believe this is the greatest irony in history. Why? Because of the name of this man who was exchanged for my master. His name is Bar, son of us, of his father. Do you get the irony? A man whose name means the son of his father was exchanged for the son of of God. This son of his father has had the same exchange. Jesus was exchanged for me. Luke tells us that the crowd chanted, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Give us Barabbas, the son of his father. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. I can read that in just a few seconds. I have here a paper from a medical expert, an archeological medical expert about scourging. And this man wrote, flogging was a legal preliminary to every Roman execution and only women and Roman senators or soldiers were exempt unless the soldier had deserted the usual instrument was a short whip with several single or braided leather thongs of variable lengths in which small iron balls or sharp pieces of bones were tied at intervals. For scourging, the man was stripped of his clothing, his hands were tied to an upright post, the back, buttocks, and legs were flogged either by two soldiers called lictors or by one's who, or by one who alternated positions. 
The severity of the scourging depended on the disposition of the soldiers and was intended to weaken the victim to a state just short of collapse or death. As the Roman soldiers repeatedly struck the victims back with full force, the iron balls would cause deep contusions and the leather thongs and bones would cut into the skin and subcutaneous tissues. As the flogging continued, the lacerations would tear into the underlying skeletal muscles and produce quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. Pain and blood loss generally sets the state for shock. The extent of blood loss may well have determined how long the victim would survive on the cross. At the Praetorium, Jesus was severely whipped. A detailed word study of the Greek text for this verse indicates that the scourging of Jesus was particularly harsh. They don't, we don't know the number of times he was hit. The Roman soldiers uh, amused that this weakened man that claimed to be a king began to mock him by placing a robe on his back. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. We're told in the other accounts that somebody gave him a reed for a staff. He's a king, you know, they're mocking him. And one of the soldiers took that reed out of his hand after they put the crown of thorns on his head and hit him over the head and drove the thorns deeper into his head. And now that blood is running down his face. They put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And now they start hitting him with their hands. Now Pilate says, Bring him out here. And he brings them out and shows Jesus with the crown of thorns, the purple robe, the blood running down his face. And he said, I want you to know that I find no fault in him. He's still trying to avoid being involved. He's a coward, political coward, afraid of the crowd. When the chief priests and the officers saw them, him, they cried out saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said, take you and crucify him. I don't find any fault in him. The Jews answered, we have a law, and by our law he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. No, he didn't make himself that. He is that. And went again into the judgment hall, Pilate did. And he is a little afraid now. He says he's the son of God and a king. He said, where'd you originate? Jesus doesn't answer him. And Pilate says, you won't talk to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Now, world leader, listen to the one who's really in charge. Jesus said, you have no power at all except it were given you. If I hadn't put you in power, you wouldn't have any from above. Therefore, he has delivered on me has a greater sin. Judas has a bigger problem than you do. God put you here for the purpose of having me crucified. Pilate did it, and Judas did it because he was greedy, maybe. But he has a greater sin than you do, Pilate. If there is such a thing, there is. Judas is more involved in an evil way than you are. You're trying to get out of it. <laughs> and from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go. Now they come at Pilate politically. They know he's a political power, coward, so watch what they do. Not Caesar's friend if you do this. We're going to tell Caesar what we wanted, and you didn't do it. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. Well... Pilate, <laughs> you old political coward, what are you going to do now? <laughs> when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that called the paper, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. That's an interesting word there. It means an elevated place. Gavatha is elevated up here. 
And it was the preparation of the Passover in about the sixth hour. It's noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold, your king. Now he mocks the crowd. But they cried out, Away with him, crucify him. Pilate says unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answers, We have no king but Caesar. They just denied that God was their king. Imagine the hatred. The Jews yell. They scream for blood. And Pilate turns Jesus over to the soldiers. You have a mob here out of hand. Not a new thing. There were mobs in Moses' day. Mobs in Joshua's day. Mobs in Jesus' day, mobs in Paul's day. We have mobs today all over this country yelling and screaming. We want this, we want that. We don't want to follow a multitude to do evil. When the mob yells, we probably should say, we're not going to listen to that. The mob is unreasonable. Shall I crucify your king? And they took Jesus and led him away. I want to stop here because almost somewhere between 10 to 14 days prior, an African probably kissed his wife on the cheek, got his two sons, and started the long trek to Jerusalem. He's Jewish, but he's from North Africa. And as he gets to Jerusalem this time, something very unusual is happening. Perhaps he heard someone say, they're going to crucify Jesus. Somehow this gentleman made his way to the front of the crowd as Jesus was making his way to Golgotha, the place of the skull, to Calvary in the Latin. Sometimes... I just want to praise him, the songwriter wrote, songwriter wrote. Sometimes just to speak his name. Sometimes I just want to thank him without asking him for a thing. Sometimes I lift my hand to him. Sometimes all I do is cry. Everything that I have, I owe to him. And the reason is Calvary. That's where Jesus is now headed. And this man is right there in the front, and Jesus stumbles and falls with the weight of this 110-pound cross piece on his back. Not the whole cross as the medieval painter's picture, just the patibulum. And he stumbles, and the soldier grabs Simon the Cyrene and asks him to help, or orders him to help Jesus carry that patibulum. And they make their way to the hill we call Calvary. And they lay him on his back and drive the nails into the carpal tunnel area of his hand so that every time he moves that palm of his hand, every nerve in his body screams with pain. They raise the patibulum up and set it on the stake, push his feet up in, and so his knees are at a 45 degree angle and turn his feet flat against the stake and drive a nail through the top of that one foot, through the metatarsal area where there are many nerves again. Every time he moved his feet, he's going to be screaming with pain. And now he's in a sag position. And over the top of this T, Pilate put a sign. This is the king of the Jews in three languages, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. That gives us our cross now, and he is crucified. He cannot breathe in that crumpled position. But an amazing thing happens. His body, his bloodstream begins to fill with carbon dioxide, and medical experts tell us that that caused convulsions in his body, and those convulsions lifted him up, and he could gasp and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
He's crucified. They took his robe, <coughs> parted it, or uh, uh, cast uh, lost for it. Why, right there at the foot of the cross, which is was prophesied that they would do. And after he said, Father, forgive them, he noticed his mother there standing with John. And Jesus said, Woman, behold your son. Mother, go home with John now. He's going to take care of you. Son, behold your mother. Take care of her, John. Right there, when he's gasping for air, he's able to think about taking care of another human being. His compassion. He will cry out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, in despair. We've already talked about that. That's a fulfillment of Psalm 22, where in despair he cried out, but we know that God did not forsake him. He cried out, I thirst. He told the thief, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He will cry out, it is finished, and then he will say, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. All of that said while he's gasping for air, being convulsed by the carbon dioxide in his bloodstream. They had a vessel there filled with a sponge, and filled a sponge with vinegar, put it upon us and put it in his mouth. He took the vinegar and said, it is finished, bowed his head and died. And we remember that we studied from John 10, 17, that he had to will himself to death. Why? Because he was not a sinner, not on the cross, not in life. He did no sin. Everything they did to him that night was illegal. Tradition tells us that John and Mary were both buried at the city of Ephesus or in the area of the city of Ephesus. I don't know about that. That's tradition. But that would mean that John took care of her until she died. So John fulfilled the request. And he's the only one of those 12 that originally were following Jesus and appointed apostles who was right there. The only one. All the rest had fled. Peter had denied him. And he hung there for six hours and died. He had had hematidrosis, probably, slapped, crown of thorns crushed on his head, scourged back was bleeding. You know when they took that robe off of him, you ever pulled a bandage off an open wound? Drove the nails through his carpal tunnel area of his palm of his hands. Drove a nail through his both of his feet at the same time. Now his nerves, every one of them in his body is screaming with pain every time he moves just a little bit, whether his feet or his hands. His body is convulsing from carbon dioxide buildup. And yet, he's compassionate enough on that cross to say, Father, forgive them. He's compassionate enough on that cross to say, John, take care of my mother. He's compassionate enough on that cross to say to the thief, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Sometimes we're heard to say that Jesus died for our sins. Yes, but really, that's only half of the story, my friends. He, he died instead of me. He took my place. It should have been Keith who was punished for his sin. He took it. All my sins to atone on that terrible, terrible cross. And then an amazing event He dies before 6 p.m., evidently, just before. And it's the preparation day, 
And they don't want those bodies that they have illegal, one of them that they've illegally crucified, to stay on there during the Sabbath day. That would be an abomination, would it not? One of our holy days, see all those bodies there. So they want to take them down. Well, maybe they're not dead yet. We'll break their legs. Then they can't be pushed up by the convulsions, and they will die of asphyxiation. Well, they came to the thief and broke his legs, and then the other thief, and they had to break his legs. Now they will die. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, and these Roman soldiers are experts in this, if they take down a body before it's dead, they can be tried. They are doing something that the Roman government will try them concerning. And so they, they know, they are experts when they know when a person is dead. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side just to make sure. And the Bible says, the force with there came out blood and water. Well, the soldier standing underneath him when he pierces that side, so the spear had to go up in this way. It would not have reached his heart. Why then blood and water? My medical doctor son told me that that indicates that the blood, the sack around the heart broke. And it stunned me when my son said that because that le leads me to think that my master died of a broken heart for me. And he that saw it bear record, John's talking now. And his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the Scripture might be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. His body was broken, but not his bones. And again, another Scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they have pierced. That happens to be a passage from Psalm 22, 16, and certainly way ahead of its time when, it, when the psalmist wrote that. He's dead. It's all over, right? Probably Satan thought, though. Thought, he probably thought he'd won. He's dead. The vinegar they were going to give him on the cross was a type of bitter drink. He would not have slaked his thirst. That was a cruel act also. So every cruelty, every illegality, he's dead. And a very courageous fellow, very wealthy fellow, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, why? Feared the Jews besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. So came Nicodemus, one of the Sanhedrin, ruler of the Jews. These two men are interesting to me. They were not open about their discipleship, but they had courage enough to go get the body. Everybody who knew anything about that would have known they did that. They brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a 100-pound weight. They're going to put that on the body to keep down the odor. Again, indicating he's dead. They took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb. Nobody had ever been laid there. I think that's to tell us that this was not a prophet's tomb. His bones weren't there. So you couldn't argue Jesus touched the prophet's bones and was raised and so on. All that tradition and superstition. This is a new tomb. It belongs to Joseph then of Arimathea. Then there laid they Jesus, therefore because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was near at hand. They didn't have to take him very far to bury his body. It's finished. He's in the tomb. The pilot will order the tomb's stone to be sealed. He will place a guard around it. 
as many as 15 men would be part of that guard. And he's going to walk out of that tomb in the body in which he entered that tomb. He is going to overcome death. And that's going to be our study in John chapters 20 and 21, the resurrection and the post-resurrection teaching. But think about what he went through, please, just physically. Body in total shock, back laid wide open. Sometimes they would beat a man until they could see the back of his lungs. He'd been flogged, slapped, thorns crushed into his skull, mocked, and everything done illegally. And that just troubles me. And yet, he could think about the crowd, his mother, and a thief, and have compassion on all three. The very ones that wanted him dead, crucify him, crucify him. He died for them. The one who was such a political coward, he would not release him. He died for him. The jealous, envious, corrupt Annas, he died for him. The corrupt Caiaphas, he died for him. The entire Sanhedrin who took him to Pilate died for them. The soldiers who flogged him and mocked him and became amused at what they were doing, he died for them. He took their place. One thief who recognized, I deserve this. He found paradise. And I want to ask you a question, friend. What more does Jesus have to do for you until you obey him? You need more, do you? Are you that covetous? about your own soul, that you won't submit it to Christ. Contact his death through baptism, my friend. Romans 6, 3 and 4. Enter the kingdom of God. Let God translate you there. Take advantage of the greatest event in history, the crucifixion of Jesus the Christ.